Greetings, Dr. Wolfula here, here to present a very important special audio presentation that your ears cannot dare unlisten to. Does that make sense? Oh, it doesn't matter. Listen to this. someone's favorite movie we're coming to you from the pod jack outside beautiful bay city michigan my name is randy and with me uh, is a man that's possessed with the spirit of rock and roll baby it's tom <laughs> co what's up sir music is my life you got those devil horns in the air i do oh you head begging real hard uh, of course you got satan's favorite whispers the the dulcet tones of one ozzy osbourne ringing in your ears Say what you all about hell, but we got you know, way better magazines down here. Hell yeah. You it sounds like you're ready, Tom Cope, for the one the only am. The Devils. Ken Russell's The Devils. That's what we're covering tonight. And um we we I we just got on the Skype call here and you said you were very nervous to talk about this, and I love a Tom Cope that's nervous and on the edge of his seat. <laughs> this is my favorite thing. Yes, because let's face it. Unfortunately, this movie has some themes that are still relevant today. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm sure to bet that no matter what opinion I have on this, I'm going to piss someone off. <laughs> probably, yeah. Pro- yeah, probably. You're going to get us canceled, aren't you, damn it? I think so, yes, sir. Oh, man, you're like, I'm sick of this dumb podcast shit, so I'm just going to put a... Uh, uh, cross go out, go out in a blaze of glory hell yeah well he's yeah. talking about the devils and broad strokes this movie is about um a charismatic priest in the 17th century france who is kind of the de facto town leader of a, a isolated town um and uh he seems to have uh all sorts of ch- charisma and away with the ladies like everyone swoons for him including one specific hunchback nun who is the uh the madam superior of the local uh the local nunnery there i'm yes, saying all the these terms uh mother reverend okay yeah i'm saying all these terms wrong but you know um so she's she's the head of that and um she she feels a little little twinge in her tome every time he she sees this this father grandier except she doesn't really see him just from afar yes and it's it's that mere thought that that brief glance from afar that gets her mind a a roman it's kind of like sixth or 17th century beatlemania yeah i mean he's he's more popular than jesus right literally (laughs) yes literally um so, I mean, there's a lot of political machinations, there's a lot of jealousy, there's a lot of pent-up sexual frustration, and um, this movie is so controversial because it all ends up turning into a giant nun orgy, n- giant nun orgy, which is my favorite favorite punk rock band. Oh, I thought you were going to say it was your favorite kind of orgy. Well, you know, I've got... It's up there. It's got to be top five, Desert Island all time favorite orgies yeah so yeah this was a movie that i walked into completely blind and normally my mo for this show just to let you in on a little secret is to watch the movie right before we record yeah and i'm really glad i took some time to actually sit and think about this movie because there's a lot going on with this thing there there is quite a bit um, it's kind of a kind of a heady artistic piece. It's it's got a lot to say. It's kind of a mess. Yeah, and it's it is controversial. I mean, as I told you, Tom Co, my introduction to this movie was from a 
from a family-friendly children's film. Space Jam 2, A New Legacy. Yes, I need to know about this. How did you find out about this movie through Space Jam? Uh, we actually talked about this, believe it or not, last summer on our episode dealing with Surf 2, but you were probably seething mad angry at me and <laughs> seeing red, so you probably weren't listening to anything I said, which is fair, because I made you watch Surf 2. I was going to say, you, you make me watch a lot of crap. Oh, how dare you. But every once in a while, you shine a light on a hidden gem such as this. See? Uh, so... In the crowd, in the in the finale, the the big basketball game, because of course it's a sports movie, it's, it's got to have a big game. Well, for whatever reason, Warner Brothers decided that the best thing to do in this instance would be to um, include every single character in their library, every piece of IP that they own, and throw it into the crowd as bystanders. For better or worse. For better or worse. Like, say what you will. I understand why I say Captain Caveman's in the crowd. I can get away with the Iron Giant. I start to have a puzzled look on my face when King Kong shows up. Oh, boy, there's there's Heath, Le- Le- there's Heath Ledger's Joker. There's Pennywise, oh. the killer of children. There's Pennywise. Movie. There's Pennywise. There's the Droogs from a clockwork orange hobnobbing with captain caveman and adam west batman hmm and also there was a nun from this movie the devils and many a film critic who was who are a lot more schooled in the art of film than i pointed this out and was like hey this character is here from this movie and I'm like, not appropriate for a children's movie. I mean, I, I do have three stepdaughters all under the age of 12. And I can tell you that their, their range of experience doesn't allow them to care or even comprehend the politics of 17th century France and sexual repression and historical. Okay, eventually, even 12 year olds are going to be curious about Easter eggs. <laughs> sure sure yeah i mean yeah once they find out about the easter bunny and not existing what <laughs> i'm sorry oh uh, fuck yeah I, but you were talking about easter eggs in the sense that, yeah, yeah. yeah. You but see what still, I, I mean i imagine that there's going to be some kid who's curious about all the background characters in that scene and they're going to do some research and they're going to find out about the rape of christ <laughs> yes yes uh, but to tell the folks what the rape of christ is by the way uh the rape of christ is one of the few remaining deleted scenes from this movie after it is proven that everything that's going on in this movie is a cross between political machinations and mass hysteria how do those nuns react to the truth being confronted to them they go over to their altar, they grab a life-size figure of Christ, drag it down, and dry hump it in every way imaginable. Yeah. Uh, needless to say, that scene has still not been s- viewed by public eyes. 51 years later, yeah, still forbidden. The other notable see. scene that's been still cut out is uh, near the end of the movie where... Uh, Abbas sister Jean or Jean or Jean or whatever the hunchback nun uh she is a redgrave yes Vanessa Redgrave that's a better way to the the wonderful Vanessa Redgrave as far as acting goes she might have a little shady history as far as political leanings go but <laughs> as far as acting goes she she was nominated and won many uh, academy awards so good for her but uh, uh, near the end of the movie, she, spoilers for a, a film based on a true story, uh, she masturbates with the charred femur bone of her crush in the shower. Which is way, way worse than the, what they put in the movie. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. So, I, 
All right, so you found out about this, much like the way a 10-year-old kid is going to be discovering Easter eggs in Space Jam. Yes, I found an article that was listing all these rant. Well, actually, I think I heard it on a podcast first that I listened to, a movie podcast, critically, critically acclaimed, where they were pointing all these things out. And then they did a uh, full episode on this movie. I was like, oh, my gosh, this sounds like something I need to track down. But it's notoriously hard to find. Uh, Shutter had it on its service for about a month last year, and then it disappeared. And I saw that it was on there again, and I'm like, we got to jump. We got to get this. Yes, and I'm so, so fucking glad we did. So it sounds like you kind of dug it. In a I way, had to, I had to stew on it, honestly, because the first 45 minutes or so I'm watching this and I'm thinking, what the fuck is this? Seriously, the first 45 minutes are kind of a chore. I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what is this? The ending, however, I think just completely redeems the entire movie. Well, yeah, I, I mean, everything does tie together if you look at it you know because i mean right from the gate i'm trying to figure out what the hell it is i'm looking at where i have a man in drag dressed as the venus de milo yeah performing in front of a cardinal yeah and it wasn't until i sat and thought about it that it's a bookend yeah where the king is presenting theater based on ancient mythology and the other end of it is a public execution and sham trial as public theater. Mm -hmm. So I can kind of understand that, but it was definitely jarring for a good long time. And luckily I had a slow day at work Mm -hmm. and I kind of sit and think about it. And it's like, okay, yeah, I can see what they're saying. I think they may have done themselves a disservice with the way that they delivered their message, but it's a good message. Yeah, I could. Yeah. This could, could have been a completely, totally excellent movie. I said that like I'm Bill and Ted, I'm sorry, but it could have been like an instant classic if it wasn't for all the grody sex and, controversy you know yeah i hate to sound like i'm clutching my pearls here but walking away from this movie immediately the first thing that you are going to talk about is all the lewdness that you're seeing on screen Mm -hmm. without really being able to even notice all of the 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 messages that they're trying to to deliver yeah and and don't get me wrong i think there is absolutely a place for nudity and sex in in movies but i think it's this is a little bit too much it's an extreme case you know it's definitely an extreme case i i i don't want to be the one to say that it's too much because my views are obviously going to be different from your views yeah. which will obviously be different from joe blow's views so mm-hmm. i don't want to say it's too much, but they obscured what I think they were trying to go for. Yeah. Uh, the aforementioned man in drag that, that, uh, opens the movie was Louis the eighth of France. This, this is actually a true story. This actually happened. He was highly influenced by his Cardinal who wielded a lot of power. Um, and in this movie, Louis the eighth is depicted as a, effeminate cross dresser transgender man who uh well, no, I mean who cares about that he's easily manipulated he's he, yeah but it's he also seems to be he seems to know things too he seems to be not completely unaware at one point he shows up in the movie in disguise yeah. as a duke and he's he's brought into the middle of the nuns going bananas, just n- naked and carrying on and uh, molesting people, and and he sh- shows this uh, this box 
to Father Barry, who shows up, who is like the king douchebag of all preachers. He's, he's yes. Pre- imagine the worst priest portrayed by David Bowie, and that's this guy. Yeah, he he claims to be an expert in exorcisms, and his entire I don't know. The way he does exorcisms is by giving people enemas, which leads to an uncomfortable scene later on. One of many. Yes. But Louis the eighth shows up with this box and he says, this contains a vial of Jesus Christ's blood. And uh, father Barry thinks he can use this to turn the orgy to get the demons out of these, these nuns. And he does it. He does this whole ritual with all this flowery language and the nuns stop for a minute and then he opens the box and there's nothing in there. And, uh, Louie basically says, have fun and leaves. Yeah. Drop well, the I, mic I, moment. I think we might be getting too far ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, there is a point to this movie. Yes, uh, there is. It starts out at the end of a religious war in France. Mm hmm between Catholics and Protestants and the powers that be in Paris, namely the Royal court and the Catholic church decide to consolidate power in order to build a new France. Yeah. One that is based on state and church being one all throughout the Southern region of France. There are these fortified cities that are independently controlled by the governors. Yes. Well, after the religious wars are done, they decide enough of that. We're not going to have a whole bunch of different fiefdoms. We're going to have one France. However, lo and behold, the governor of this town called Loudon had a promise from Louis VIII saying that their walls will stay. Mm -hmm. These people have fought and been loyal to the crown of France They're fine on their own. Well, Cardinal Richelieu, who, uh, from what I understand, was a pretty, pretty gnarly dude, let's put it that way, uh, decided, uh, no, I want control of everything and sends his minions in there to go and tear down the walls. Mm -hmm. No more of these uh, self-governed cities. You're all under the crown. Well, there is a priest there who is the manliest man you are ever going to see in a collar. Seriously, watching this movie, I swear to God, I developed an instant five o'clock shadow watching Oliver (laughs) Reed. Yeah, Oliver Reed as Father Urbane Grandier. He stands up and says, listen, I'm in control of the city. I have the word of Louis VIII that these walls shall stand. I'm showing a perfect example of how Catholics and Protestants can coexist together and get along just fine. We don't need to be fighting each other. Well, the last thing a person in power wants to have is citizens that are getting along with each other. Yeah. So he looks for anything he can do to get rid of this one priest. Turns out this priest, kind of a horn dog. He has uh he's a bit of a cad this guy. He he's been betting a the daughter of a local father and while under the guise of good giving latin lessons, which that's some latin, hey. Mm. Um and when this girl is impregnated, he kind of breaks things off with her and kind of moves on. He's like, "Eh, <laughs> he's going to be the uh quintessential absent father." It's kind of an odd choice that Ken Russell took as a filmmaker to have the protagonist instantly unlikable. I, I'll I'll tell you why it was a bad choice in my eyes, because he's instantly unlikable. And then all of a sudden he comes around and is a great man. Yes. And it's not because he stands up for a city or anything like that. He meets a girl and falls in love. And all After of it's a, been well established that he has no problem with knocking noble ladies up, has no problem hanging out with prostitutes. Yeah. He, all of a sudden, this lady, this nun, confesses that she's in love with him just by his mere sight. He's like, you know what? Let's get married. Yeah. I thought, I thought that was kind of an odd character turn. And he's just instantly smitten and 
he's writing like poetry and poetic letters and uh, they marry in secret, which turns out to be a huge scandal. And uh, all this leads to the abbess of, of the, uh, the, the convent finding out and becoming instantly jealous. Yes, because this convent convent of nuns are all obsessed with this dude. They're all fantasizing about him. And then lo and behold, one of their own marries him in secret. And all shit breaks loose. Right. Because from what I know of, I'm not a religious man, Tom Co. So enlighten me. Nuns okay. aren't allowed to have sex, right? Last I knew, the it was frowned upon. Yes. Um, and, and it's established that Sister Jean has had a pretty hard life. She may even have turned to becoming a nun based on her deformity. Well, I mean, at one point when I can't remember the the wife's name, but she says that she wants now that her parents are both dead she wants to serve the people she wants to serve god and yeah. uh mother Vanessa Red, redgrave <laughs> says that the whole reason why all of these nuns are here is because their families couldn't afford dowries to marry them off and mm-hmm. they just wanted to get rid of them nobody in that convent wants to be there nobody in that convent wants to serve god yeah they're just stuck and all of a sudden, the person in charge goes completely fucking batshit. And through a, a weird series of circumstances, they just follow along. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, at one point, they're led into the woods and it looks like they're going to be executed. And uh, Father Barry pretty much says, along with... um. What what was the the other guy's name? The, the Baron. That was the guy that wanted to tear the the yeah. down. Yeah, on the the, app originally. Yeah, the Baron and Father Barry. They they basically say that uh, they're gonna kill the nuns unless they, I don't slut know, it up. slut it up. Maybe maybe have a little religious frenzy there and see what you can do. And they instantly just go for it. Well. I can't blame the nuns on this one. No, me neither. <laughs> if my choice is have a lot of sex and party hard or die, I'm not going to take a lot of time to think about that. Yeah, I think that's an Andrew WK pro tip, actually. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So they definitely party hard, and there's nudity. and um, Lots of nudity. Lots of nudity. There's lots of masturbation and insinuation and... Boy, oh boy. There's, I'm, so, there, I'm so glad I didn't watch this with the wife. Oh, I, I'm so <laughs> glad you didn't either. You, <laughs> you'd be grounded from ever talking to me. Yes. I don't want you to associate with that man. He's a bad influence <laughs> on you. She's watching as a topless nun burns a Bible and tears the pages out. You're like, oh, no. Not going to lie, kind of hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... They blame this sudden, uh, this sudden "quote unquote" possession on Father Urbane. Well, they don't. Well, they don't. I, I'm talking about the Baron and. Uh, well, no. The whole thing was uh, Vanessa Redgrave was jealous that this man that she is lusting after went and he basically. Decided, you know what? He's a priest, but he's still going to marry a woman anyway. Yeah. Not only is he breaking his vow of chastity, but he did it with another woman. Right. Yeah. Which, looking at it with a 2022 view, I'm not sure if that's exactly politically correct. But on the other hand, it is, from what I've been able to read, kind of based on fact. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So she tells the heads of the church that 
the reason why she's acting this way is because Father uh, Grand, what was it, Grandier? Grandier. Grandier uh, visited her with six of his demons, yep. had his way with her and all of the convent. Yes. Which, next thing you know, he's being investigated, he's being tried in just this bizarre trial. And, yeah, it... Now, like we said, it's it's based on historical fact. So, um, during this this trial, this a document was entered into. This is real life, believe it or not. Yeah, was entered into court, and it was apparently signed by Grandier, which you know it wasn't. Uh, but even it, if it was, yeah, was he under duress? All that stuff. Yeah, yeah. but it was written in Latin. And it had a bunch of weird symbols on it, and it was signed by a bunch of demons, because, you know, demons can write, too. Uh, 17th century. And this document that was admitted as evidence said, We, the influential Lucifer, the young Satan, Beelzebub, Leviathan, Elmi, and Astaroth. First of all, I love the young Satan. That's got to be a rapper's name somewhere, right? If not, at least a sitcom. Ah, let's let's pitch that to NBC. I you know what? I think we got a million dollar idea on our answer. Yep. Together with others, have today accepted the covenant pact of Urbain Urbain Grandier, who is ours. In him, do we promise the love of women, the flower of virgins, the respect of monarchs, honors, lusts, and powers. He will go whoring three days long. The carousel will be dear to him. He offers us once in the year a seal of blood under the feet. He will trample the holy things of the church and he will ask us many questions with this pact. He will live 20 years happy on the earth of men and will later join us to sin against God bound in hell in the council of demons. <laughs> Lucifer, Beelzebub, Satan, Astaroth, Leviathan, Elmi. It was all it was missing was love Lucifer, Beelzebub, Satan, you know, but, well, that seems fun. Yeah, pretty cut and dry. Yeah, I mean, he must have been a real demonic man. Or not. Or not. And this entire trial of a famous man was uh, a big public event. Everybody turned out. Everyone wanted to see what happened. Certainly well, that like wouldn't. That, but... Certainly that wouldn't hurt. Happen today, Amber Heard, Johnny Depp. Nobody cares no, about such things, no, right? Of course not. But not only that, but the town kind of exploited the situation by turning this convent into a tourist trap. (laughs) Right. Where they would have nobility come, disguised, of course, because they're bashful, to go and watch these nuns have an orgy amongst themselves and desecrate the church. Yeah, come watch this these rowdy nuns. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. And let's face it, they probably had a vested interest in keeping this thing going for as long as they did. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, you watch this and you're like, this this is crazy. This is wild. But it's not too wild and it's not too crazy to think that somebody would frame a, a man in their way and, and frame him for doing things that weren't even remotely true just in the interest of political power and political gain. Well, not only that, but you also have the whole idea of a uh, cult of personality, mass mm-hmm. hysteria, whipping a crowd into a frenzy to do things that they might not otherwise do on their own. Yeah. That's, I mean, humans kind of suck. Humans do suck. Yeah. I, I, uh, we've seen recently all it takes is yeah. a tweet to end somebody's entire livelihood and career. Yeah. Um, it just takes a well-placed cell phone video for somebody to completely, uh, I mean, take years to recover from something like that. Mm-hmm. Could be the simplest thing. Could be a major thing. Some of it's with merit, some of it's without, but. Uh, stranger things have happened. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Now, 
this movie kind of caused a stir when it came out, correct? It was very controversial. I, I mean, as you would expect, right? Mm. But I, I think that the controversy that was surrounding this movie kind of misses the point of the entire film. Because let's face it, yes, there is shocking things that you're seeing as far as a religious orgy among nuns mm-hmm. and all of that other stuff. But I kind of think that the point isn't that the film saying that the church is bad as much as it's saying that the power is behind the church. And especially when they try to, you know, maybe influence public policy. Those are the bad people because they tried to keep us regular folks divided while they're behind the scenes grabbing all of the power, all of the wealth, all of the material goods. Am I, am I off base on this? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And it, it, it was criticized for all the, the sex and controversy. But it was also one of the most popular films in 1972 in Britain because controversy sells tickets, right? And let's face it, I think that's why those shocking scenes are in there. You, I mean, it's kind of like the opposite of, you know, using honey instead of vinegar to attract flies. You're using the ugliness to draw attention to the message. But the problem is I think the message got lost in the execution. Mm -hmm. No pun intended. Yeah. Uh, Because again, all you're going to talk about at first blush with this movie is, Oh my God, did you see that beaver shot from the nun? (laughs) Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I hate to sound like a prude, but I, I really think the, the filmmakers did themselves a disservice by going as over the top as they did. Yeah. Uh, the performance, uh, the performances in this movie are, are great. They're great. Vanessa Redgrave is borderline deranged in her performance. Uh, you can tell that the the character she plays is a little bit off kilter, a little yeah. bit tilted sideways. And Oliver Reed, especially at the end, delivers an all-time performance. I mean, he's just great. Well, the thing I like about his uh, character arc is the fact that he comes to realize that, yes, he does have things that he has to confess. Mm -hmm. His vanity, his lust, his need for power and attention. The problem is is that those aren't what he uh, is supposed to confess to, so he's going to burn anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's, without a doubt, he's he's done his fair share of sinning, and we've only seen a little bit of it, but mm-hmm. that's not really why he's here. Uh, it's a case of his reputation, maybe. I don't think it's even the fact that he has a reputation as Just much as... Just his power? And... Well, not even that, but the fact that he is galvanizing the entire city around him to stand up to the crown. Yeah. You know, you can't have that if you want to remain in power on a national level. Yeah, it, it's kind of ironic that the moment he, he's dead, the, the walls explode. Well, it's not the moment that he dies. The last thing he sees through the flames is the destruction of those walls. Yeah. Yeah. And I also really like the one of the last confessions that he made was to the townsfolk saying, I'm sorry, I did not defend your city well enough. Yeah. Yeah. And even the the executioner, he he's set to be burned at the stake. Yeah, the executioner was the only one dude who was willing to do him a favor. The, he he secretly get, set, makes a pact with the father saying that... Uh, I'll strangle you beforehand. You're not going to suffer. And then one thing leads to another and the fire gets lit and the executioner can't get to him. And he's, he's apologizing. Yes. He's like, I can't, yes. I can't. The flames are too high. I said, stop Sorry, this. I said, I'd strangle him, <laughs> which I mean, given, given the options, I guess I would choose strangulation over being burnt alive. Yeah. Yeah. So here's my big question about this movie is 
what is Warner Brothers doing with this? I'm, I'm genuinely confused because on one hand, they seem like they want to kind of keep this thing buried, if not at, at least at arm's length. Yeah. But if that were the case, why would they license it to be streaming on on Shutter, let alone having an Easter egg in a children's movie? Yeah, right. Well, I mean, the Shutter thing is, let's face it, Shutter is like the redheaded stepchildren of streaming services. Okay, but if they were trying to completely suppress this movie, why would they give them a license to exhibit it? I, I don't know. I don't know. I. The bigger question is why. I, I'm guessing that there, there, there's some major film fans who were putting together those background scenes of uh, Space Jam, and they're like, nobody will ever notice this. At least the suits won't notice it. They're just going to notice LeBron I James can, and Bugs Bunny. I can see that, but on my lunch break, I watched a BBC documentary on this movie because, again, this this movie stuck to my bones. No right. Intended. Yeah. And all of the scenes that are still not in the British Certificate X version of this movie are in that documentary. So oh. they're out there. You can see the Rape of Christ. You can see the full scene with uh, the, 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 the priest's uh, charred firmer, uh-huh. uh, femur. It's out there. So why don't you just – and on top of that, from what I understand, there is an exhibition uh, reel – of this movie that is as close to the director's vision that has been screened several times with the permission of Warner brothers, just release it. You don't have to press DVDs. You can just sell it digitally. The distribution cost will be nothing. All you have to do is upload it and put a price tag on it. Well, honestly, you could, you could put it on Blu-ray and distribute it through any number of specialized sellers and it would do oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. There are all kind of boutique, uh, labels out there like scream factory and whatnot. That would scream die. factory criterion criterion would probably do it. Vinegar syndrome. Like any of them would, would love to have this movie. I, I guarantee it. And it, it's not, you, you do it that way. It's not a mass market re- uh, release. It's not going to be found in your local Walmart. You're not going to have yeah, to worry about it. Exactly. I don't think it'd be a good idea to re-release this in theaters on a national level. That's just asking for problems. Yeah. But at least give the very small niche audience that has been clamoring for this for apparently 50 odd years, just give it to them. You'll make your money. Yeah. And any sort of uh, controversy, you can just be like, oh, it was a different time then. You know, exactly. I mean, it's, it's not, it's just refer to, to the state of Ken Russell's and be done with it. I mean, you've, you've already put the devil side by side with Bugs Bunny and, and Batman. So why would you, I don't know. Why would you shy away from it? Well, not to mention there are worse things out there in the mainstream. I mean, look at the crucifix scene in the exorcist. To me, in my eyes, that is just as, if not more shocking than most of the things that you're going to see in The Devils. Yeah, very true. And The Exorcist is regarded as a classic, and nobody would hesitate to screen that or release that. No. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't don't understand. There must have been something going on in the 70s, too, because... Man, they really love their their small, isolated religious towns and their burning at the end, their sacrificed burnings. Because this made me, the, the ending to this reminded me of the Wicker Man. And the whole damn thing reminded me of the Wicker Man yeah. and uh, Straw Dogs and all of these isolated yeah. backward European towns that us Americans just can't understand. I know. It makes me not want to go to Europe at all. I'm like, I'd stay away from these villages because I'm going to exactly. end up like on a spike somewhere or something. <laughs> yes, you too will be on the rack spinning outside of the city walls. Oh, man. I, I was watching that and Pookie, my wife, whom I adore, was watching it with me. And I was like, man, people are messed up. Yeah, the the, pa- the past sucked. <laughs> yes. I mean, geez. Granted, it, it was kind of metal. Yeah. 
I, it's pretty metal to get spin your enemies around on a giant, I don't know, pinwheel, but um, you, boy, that would suck. So, bottom line, who would you recommend this movie to? Oh, God, who would I recommend it to? Uh, film fans. I was going to say, this is strictly for movie geeks. This is not something that you... Yeah, I can't believe... Honestly, I can't believe this movie got made in 1971. I would recommend it to film fans because, one, the subject matter. Two, it's not an easy watch. It's not easily accessible, especially the first 45 minutes, like we said. It's kind of abstract and like dreamlike and weird and... You're not sure what exactly is going on at first, uh, but it does pick up in the end. And as far as what kind of film fan I would recommend it to, uh, an overall lover of cinema, I would say, because while it's on Shudder, it's not necessarily a horror or a thriller, although it has elements of both. It's just kind of its own little thing. I wouldn't wouldn't say that this is a horror movie as much as just a historical drama. Yeah, I know. that. That's why it's kind of out of place on Shudder, I think. But I don't know. You got to put it somewhere. Way. Yeah. Yeah. How, I mean, how about you? Who would you recommend it to? Film geeks. I mean, this is a very, very well-made movie. It's just obscure enough to be a cult classic. Uh, I would put it to anybody who is sick of the same old, same old uh, blockbuster shit that we're getting these days. Mm-hmm. I can honestly say that I've never seen a movie like this. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a challenging movie. It's something that you have to pay attention to. It's something that you got to think about before you can really form an opinion. Uh, but it is not for everybody. No, I'm so I'm glad I watched it. I'm glad I crossed this off the list. But I'm not. I don't know how quick I am to revisit it. That's what I was gonna say. I'm not sure that I'll watch it soon or even ever again. But I'm glad I did. You know. You know, maybe if they release uh, the actual restored version that we know has been exhibited, if they were to release that on digital or Blu-ray, I might purchase it. Yeah, I would be curious to see that, I think. You know, give me a mess of special features. I'd be all about it. Mm -hmm. But just to sit down and watch it because I'm bored, that's that's a tall order. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, Do do we have time for one more thing, Tomko? We always have time for one more thing, sir. Well, this is completely the opposite of everything we just talked about. But I wanted to talk about real quickly a movie that came out just recently. A movie called Chippendale Rescue Rangers, Time Co. Huh? Oh, yes. Chippendale Rescue Rangers was dumped on the Disney Plus. Okay. And everybody's going to say this, and I'm going to say it too. It's the new Roger Rabbit. Really? And I say this because Roger Rabbit's in, in the movie, but also nobody's shying away from the fact that it's the new Roger Rabbit. It stars Chippendale, of course, of... Uh, Rescue Rangers fame and those old vintage cartoons that you forgot about. Oh, no, no, no. That's got one of the best theme songs of all time. Absolutely. And this version, Post Malone does the theme song. You're welcome, millennials. But uh, in this version, Chippendale play actors who were once on a show called Chippendale Rescue Rangers. And they live in a toon town. And uh, Dale has... Uh, well, there was a falling out between Chip and Dale, and years later, yada, 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 Dale has gotten uh, CGI plastic surgery, so he's a fully 3D CGI creation, while Chip is still a 2D animated thing. And um, their good friend from the the Rescue Rangers gets kidnapped, Monterey Jack. And there's, I was going to say, wasn't he named after a cheese? He was. And uh, he his cheese addiction is brought up in the movie. He's trying to kick it, but man, it keeps seriously. Pulling. They're talking about addiction on Chip and Dale. Well, I mean that you you need to understand how it's great twenty twenty two, Tom. Yeah, and uh, so there's an underground bootleg movie ring going on where these tunes get kidnapped and uh, get 
basically cartoon plastic surgery and re-released into the wild to act in bootleg European films like Little Fish Lady, which is The Little Mermaid. At one point, Flounder from The Little Mermaid gets kidnapped and put under the knife and uh, looks like completely different and is forced to star in a Little Mermaid ripoff. And they thought legalized weed wouldn't hurt anybody. And uh, so this is a project from uh, Andy Samberg, who I think is hilarious. I think he's really good. And he voices Dale and Chip is voiced by John Mulaney. And every single scene uh, you have to pay attention to because it's full of Space Jam 2-esque cameos, but done right, done cleverly. Um. So you're saying that there isn't a nun who wants to fuck a statue of Jesus in the background? No, there's not that. I'm out. I am out. Out. But, but I will say, spoiler alert, the big boss called Sweet Pete, who is running this underground bootleg cartoon ring, is a grown-up, bitter, angry Peter Pan. <laughs> that is awesome it's it's fucking phenomenal and you got to pay attention to the movie because there's just little sight gags like at one point they passed a park bench and there's an advertisement for governor butthead on the, on the no. bench uh he-man and skeletor are in it uh tigra from the avengers yes tigra who's the first avenger to share a movie with a Disney property, Tigra is. That's right. Because why not? Because why not? And Roger Rabbit's in it. And like all sorts of random awesome cartoon. It's including Darkwing Duck, who is like due for a resurgence, don't you think? Him, uh, Tailspin, Gargoyles, all of that. I can't believe there hasn't been more gargoyles. Well, and and Baloo is a big part of the uh, Dale's CGI reassignment because he was uh, the first cartoon to do it. So the Baloo from Tailspin got this uh, CGI surgery and became the Baloo in the John Favreau, The Jungle Book. And this movie talks about it. God damn it, I'm going to have to fucking watch Chimp and Dale because of you. It's a smart, fun, little satire uh, it doesn't take itself seriously and, uh, you can watch it with kids if you have them and the adults are going to love it too. So yeah. now speaking of kids, I watched a movie that was definitely not meant for kids. Oh, I, I expect nothing less from you, sir. Well, of course. Uh, and that was the Northman. Oh, okay. I I've heard uh, good things about this one. Imagine Braveheart with rage issues <laughs> okay and willem dafoe in a loincloth sold of course uh i mean the great thing about this movie is visually it's amazing story-wise it's pretty simple okay yeah i mean it, it's nothing to get too excited about but the cool thing about it is that it's based on the Nordic folktale, which I guess originally inspired Hamlet. So there's a lot of crossover between those two stories. Oh, I didn't either, know that. Either that's going to be a make it or break it detail for you, but the stories are very, very, very similar. Oh, Willem the Fo- Did you see Spider Man No Way Home yet? Yes, I did. Will and well, Defoe in that movie. Stole that movie. Jeez Louise, is he amazing. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God, is he good. Well, he's one of those people that can go out and do a huge billion-dollar blockbuster movie and also do this little tiny art house movie and be just as effective in both of them. Yeah, but he was acting his face off in that movie. It's uh, I was like, Jesus. And they did the right thing. They took the goblin's mask off. You don't need a green goblin mask when you got Willem Dafoe. That's exactly. scary enough. Damn it. Exactly. What did you think of the movie overall? Which one? Uh, no Way Home or The Northman? Well, both, but No Way Home is what I'm interested in. You know what? It was uh, it was a great Spider-Man movie. Uh, I wouldn't say it's uh, in the top tier as far as cinema goes, 
but for what it is, I had a really good time with it. I agree. I think it's one of the best Spider-Man movies uh, behind maybe uh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man 2, I think, still, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's still a really hard, high bar to to hop over. As far as the Marvel era, Tom Holland, who I, I love as Spider-Man, but as far as Tom Holland and Spider-Man goes, this was the first Spider-Man movie in my eyes. This is the one that got it right for the first time. Yeah, but I do kind of want to see something done with Toby. Oh, I do too. I want to see and, something. And, and if nothing else, that movie made me uh, feel the impossible, which was anything for the Andrew Garfield iteration. Andrew Garfield was so good in this too. Yes. Andrew Garfield was amazing. I, I was like, I love Andrew Garfield. Let's have more Andrew Garfield. Every Never scene he I'd was in, that. every scene he was in, he was like, he he was at the top of his game too. He was just charismatic and likable and you're like where was that in the two amazing spider-mans this goes to show you i mean who's behind the camera is just as important as who's in front of it yeah i i I appreciate how they didn't shy away from any of the cinematic spider-man histories they embraced it didn't care how ridiculous or silly it was electro was still a guy that fell in a vat of electric eels it was fine Whatever. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'd say uh, out of this latest batch of Marvel movies, this one stands head and shoulders over, you know, Shang Chi, the Eternals, all of that. I would agree with that, but I haven't seen Shang Chi or the Eternals. But I would guess it doesn't even come close. And you're not missing much. Yeah, I'll see them eventually, but you know. All right. So, what do we have on the docket next, sir? Well, we're going to stop talking about such mainstream bullshit like Spider-Man No Way Home. God. A bunch of posers? Yeah. We're we're going to talk about Wired next, time, Co. Oh, I wish you could see me rubbing my hands together on this one. I uh, uh, tell people about Wired because you can you've been bothering me about this for years now. Well, ever since before I could talk, literally. I've been a big John Belushi fan. John Belushi is one of those cautionary tales that have stopped me from doing heroin. Thank oh. you, John. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. I'm, gl- yeah. I'm, gl- I'm glad you had someone to look up to. I'm glad that before you t- you could talk that you knew John Belushi <laughs> and you were like, nope, John no Belushi heroin. Says heroin's bad. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Tom Coe's uh, first words, you have it here, heard it here first. It was no heroin. But. This is perhaps the single most disrespectful biopic ever. You sent me the trailer of it like last year or the year before, and I was like, what is this train wreck? Holy shit. Yeah, because, again, I'm a big John Belushi fan. I think that that guy just had talent that is once in a lifetime. This movie doesn't focus on any of that it just fact focuses on the fact that the dude was a junkie at the end of his life that's it that's all the movie is and somehow for whatever reason bob woodward's a major character in it. <laughs> even though yeah yeah he wrote the book it's based on doesn't matter he's a he's a character in it yeah that's interesting i'm, I'm excited to watch this one yeah, I, you're gonna want uh, you're gonna want to take a shower afterward. <laughs> oh boy! Oh God! Uh, uh that's oh, I don't know. How, wow. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm I'm up we for the challenge. The movie with nuns getting on with each other. Surely you can handle a comedian shooting heroin and dying. I I think I can. I I th- I think I can. I know Spoiler I can. Alert. I, I'm the little engine that could. I think it can. I, I think you know can. I have all the faith in you, Randall. I appreciate that. Also, I'm going to try to convince you to do something called Slasher Saturdays, where we also watch a slasher movie, like two episodes in one week. I mean, what could be crazier than that? You know what? Line it up. Line it up. Not like heroin, though. Tell no. people where they can find you on this World Wide Web. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on Twitter at The Drunken Dork. Uh, and even though it hasn't really had a whole lot of activity, if you're on Facebook, you can reach out to us at a group called Jake and Tom Conquer the Group. 
Randy, what about you, though, sir? Ah, that's all you're left to. That's all that's left. You're I, conquering you know groups. What? Once I, you you wanted to conquer a world, now you're conquering groups. Ugh. Uh, well, you know what? After a while, I just I did all the conquering that I had in me. Well, even doc- I, I at least got the continent. Even Doctor Doom gets tired sometimes. Exactly. I get it. I get it. You can find me on a big dumb comedy show called Miserable Retail Slave. Uh, you can find me at Twitter at M Retail Slave. You can find me on a Seinfeld rewatch podcast, which will be released. Never. I'm just going to keep hyping it and never release it. But there is five episodes that will be released at some point this year. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> it's called That's a Shame. It's good fun. Good fun. So, uh, you know, what? I'll take your word for it. Yeah, you should. You should take my word for it. Everyone should take my word for it. Um, if you have a suggestion of a movie we should cover, you can email me at someone's favorite movie podcast at gmail.com or just hit us up on our socials and we'll check it out. Check it out. Uh, man, we've got a, a summer full of delights. I'm sure who knows what kind of, I've got some ideas for some crap we can watch and you know, if, if slasher Saturdays would be a fun thing. I mean, we could yeah, watch, you know what? Thanks to you. I actually went back and rewatched uh sleep away camp. I mean, you're welcome. Yeah, you know what? That's actually one of those movies that I think is way better the more you watch it. Yeah. When you, when you know what's going on. Yeah, if you if you missed it in the archives, we covered the entire Sleepaway Camp franchise, which is actually a lot better than some of these other franchises we, we've yeah, gotten, believe it or not. I did not see that coming. Yeah, me neither. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. This is a, a switch. I didn't think this would be the case, but boy i dare say the sleepaway camp Those franchise three were pretty solid yeah in term of rate in terms of statistics and ratios might be better than the halloween franchise Ooh, Ooh you know what i want to argue with you on that one but i can't <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, yeah i mean when halloween is good it's great but when it's not Womp, rather, womp, womp. You know what? I think I'd rather uh, chew my wrist out than watch uh, Halloween 6 again. No matter which version you have. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You can you can spin it any way you want. Yeah, I don't care. Producers cut, theatrical cut. I ain't watching that shit. Nope. Well, I think that about wraps it up. In turn. I think so too. So in that case, uh, we will see you next week. Uh, I, I got my uh, needle and syringe out. Let's talk about John Belushi. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll see you next time on someone's <laughs> favorite movie. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Mm-hmm.